Hello, everyone. Glad to be speaking with you all once again on this um, second iteration of our world's most ethical companies office hours. Um, again, just a quick recap of, of why we've introduced this program for this year. So this has really been a forum that we have been able to interact with the community to share common questions we've received from the few weeks prior to address your concerns in real time. Um, again, capture and reiterate feedback to the community all in one, one place in a, uh, um, a live forum. And uh, this is also a way in which we can provide some tips, some support, and any, again, any other trends or guidance we've seen um, having been interacting with the community for uh, the entire application period. So both Neil and I are here to answer your questions today and just to reiterate, reiterate rather uh, Chelsea's comments from before. Please do submit your questions for those of you in attendance live today. And um, otherwise, we'll be able to uh, go through your comments and questions, address them one at a time, as well as uh, address some, uh, again, other questions, concerns we've gotten over the last several weeks. So um, with that, Neil, anything you want to cover or check off before we perhaps jump right into some of the questions we've received? Oh, no, I, I think that's a great kind of summary of what we're trying to get at here. And, you know, we just want to be a welcoming forum for all sorts of questions, big and small, uh, no matter what around the process, we just want to make sure that you are comfortable. Uh, submitting your questions, making sure you're getting the right responses, and that you're able to engage with us with the process and uh, get the most that you can out of the WMEC 2022 process. Great. Thank you, Neil. Uh, jumping right in, one thing I wanted to touch on that we've received a few comments on throughout the, uh, the last several weeks was interacting with our brand new applicant forum, right? So um, we are introducing for the 2022 application year, a brand new applicant portal, with which helps facilitate you all as applicants through submitting materials, providing resources, and really generally interacting with the entire applicant experience. So one common issue we've, we've received is um, when you receive the credentials to uh, access your instance of the portal, Copying and pasting the username and password provided is resulting in some errors. Sometimes we ask that you, uh, if you are receiving errors and trying to access your portal, simply type in the characters provided to access that portal. Um, and that should be able to remediate most of the issues that we're seeing. Um, I think we're copying an extra space or so when folks are copying from the email provided. So instead try to just access the, the portal simply by typing in the credentials provided in that method. Um, and with that, so Neil, I wanted to posit something to you right out of the gate. Uh, sure. I know we have uh, a very expansive process underpinning the world's most ethical companies recognition program. And one of those sections is impact, uh, mm -hmm. corporate social responsibility, citizenship, environmental sustainability. So we're looking at uh, ways in which perhaps companies should be thinking about this section, um, strategies that perhaps you can bring to bear for the community today, uh, perhaps even tips on navigating the section as well. I understand this is one of the the most the, one of the sections in our process that's seen the most change over the last several years in particular. So perhaps if you want to you know address that question that we receive from time to time again, and really how to think about and approach the the impact section of the questionnaire. That's great. Yeah, no, this is one of the sections that's seen quite a lot of change. You're absolutely right. And Ethosphere has worked over the past couple of years to really dig in to efforts by companies to understand and to better understand where they're looking at risks and opportunities that important stakeholders, such as their employees, such as their clients and customers, and as well as their investor base, uh, tend to bring to their attention uh, and that companies take an active effort to seek out these opportunities and these risk areas so that they can better address them. What Ethosphere is trying to get at with this area of the survey, which this year is in section nine, as we've reorganized everything in 2021 and prior years, this was section six. Uh, what we're trying to really get at is figuring out how are you identifying these risk areas and these opportunity areas? Like, are, are you tracking them? Are you identifying them by talking to your stakeholders? Are you then looking at metrics to see where your company is, how it's progressed in addressing these opportunities and risks and mitigating those and taking active efforts to really address it? And then talking back to those stakeholders, telling them, hey, this is what we've identified as the issue or the risk or the opportunity. And these are the efforts that we're going to make year over year over year in order to address this, such as reducing our waste 
or our impact on water and water resources, or uh, our, our, you know, maybe it's employee concerns with wages and living wage in a particular area. Uh, being fully transparent about the efforts you're putting, in, your organization is putting into place to really address those concerns with the stakeholders, make sure that the public, potential new employees or other investors can see that you are trying to lead the conversation in terms of addressing these areas. Uh, a lot of our questions here are around those, those efforts that you're taking around identifying it, having those conversations, talking within your company and outside of your company about how to address the risks. Really, it's, it's an exercise in risk management and taking control of opportunities here. So that's quite a, quite a lot of the first part of the impact section. The second half tends to focus more on issues around your reporting and your statements out around things like how your business addresses the concept of human rights in the way that it does it. It is kind of an impact that you have in terms of addressing, uh, uh, you know, living wages for people in in. Uh, situations in countries where it may be difficult to ensure that people are uh, are, are getting what they need uh, uh, from your organization, from society as large, and what your company is doing in that space in order to make sure that employees are treated well and that contractors are treated well and third parties are treated well. Um, so we do ask a number of questions around that and your efforts at outlining what are we doing how are we doing it? How are we identifying the risk? And then how are we talking back about that? Uh, finally, in the impact section, we ask a lot of items around the benefits that you provide to your employees, uh, which help them adjust to working life uh, and to life outside. Well, uh, again, uh, addressing those employee-related risks, as well as sections around how are you addressing issues around mental health and mental health of the employees, something that's become very important given the situation with the COVID pandemic. How are companies addressing the additional stresses on their employees uh, upon uh, the people that, the re that they reply, yeah, re rely on every day? Um, and so we're asking a lot of questions around those steps that your organization is taking to really support mental health and well-being in the workplace. Uh, so th those are the major kind of things that we're wanting to see is how are you identifying risks? What are you doing? to address those risks, and then how are you being transparent with all of your involved stakeholders about your progress? That's great, Neil, thank you. We had a question come in recently regarding a term we use in our ethics quotient survey, specifically how we define the term implementation within section two of the survey. And section two refers to the program structure, oversight, responsibility, and resources portion of the survey. And throughout that section, we use the term implementation of the ethics compliance program throughout. Uh, we use that oftentimes in tandem or next to uh, responsibility for oversight and implementation. And then later in the survey, we actually delineate between do you have separate individuals with implementation responsibility versus oversight responsibility. So the question we received is throughout this section for the term implementation, what do we mean? And, and Neil, if I'm not mistaken, the term implementation was one that we utilized new for this year that came right out of the, out of the June D, uh, DOJ guidance yes. uh, specifically, right? So that was a term that we borrowed from the latest iteration from the Department of Justice guidance from June, 2020, um, and incorporated that into our survey as well. The, the previous term we, we used that I believe is the closest parallel is um, for implementation, we, we referenced the person with day-to-day -day responsibility of the program. And so you can think of separating implementation responsibility from oversight responsibility as, as through that lens, right? Who has ultimate um, responsibility for the overall program and ownership of the program? And is that person different from the uh, individual or individuals who are actually doing the implementation and administration work of the program? So that may have been a broad description, but Neil, I'm curious if you have any other clarification you'd, you'd provide for how we define the term implementation. No, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's that distinction between the overall, we used to use the term ownership, you're right, uh, that, that overall guidance that that person is giving and whether that person really truly is that day-to-day, -day, you know, if, if they've got their feet on the ground, they, they've got people talking to them constantly about the program, they're making constant decisions about which 
one, do we, which decision do we make? How do we implement this? Uh, who, who would you go to in order to make that decision and have that decision happen? That person would be the implementer, right? And mm-hmm. maybe the oversight person, if that is a separate person, might give some additional guidance and insight into that, but they may not necessarily be the one making that day-to-day decision. And we wanted to make sure we were drawing that distinction, uh, the way that uh, DOJ was kind of giving us some some guidance to do. So, no, I, I think you're absolutely on track, Doug. Great. Great. Yeah, great question, by the way, from, from the individual who submitted it. Neil, another question came in regarding supporting documentation. And in specifically, for 2022, this application year, we emphasize more explicitly the desire to see a written summary for the sections that we ask for documentation, right? Provide for us, provide for the review team, a summary description of what we can expect to see through the materials, right? And so this is all described in our supporting documentation guidelines for this year. But the question we received was, uh, should we assume as applicants that uh, they should also be describing or including a narrative for sections where there isn't any specific supporting documentation listed in our guidelines? And an example of that is a third party management section, right? So should they, as an applicant, be considering drafting a similar narrative for those sections where documents aren't explicitly required per our guidelines? Uh, again, great question. And in my experience, I think that is helpful. Um, Providing that written narrative gives you an opportunity, regardless if there's a documentation, an explicit documentation request or not, to really set the context for the entire area for the review team, right? So if, in particular, if there's aspects of using the example provided third-party management that you believe aren't accurately reflected for the practices you're doing in the survey itself, that written narrative is yours to help illustrate for the team uh, filling in some of those detailed gaps that perhaps aren't captured objectively or, or systematically through the questionnaire. So I think it's a great idea. You're welcome to do it. We we specifically, I think, allocated <clears throat> the, the description piece for those areas with documentation with a focus on providing guidance or rather clarification on the documents themselves. But we welcome all applicants to provide a similar explanation across any section they deem worthy of having one as part of the application. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. Um, you know, if if you keep it simple, if you keep it as something that helps somebody who's uh, in in the not who has not been in the mindset of seeing your program day to day, simple guidance like that, it's great. Wonderful. Uh, if it doesn't necessarily fit into a specific folder that we've laid out, feel free to simply leave that in the top folder for our review team so that we uh, can just see that document and read it as it is. Just uh, name it in the title, whatever it refers to, and we should be able to see that. Uh, also know that there is no penalty for not having this. Uh, your, your, your scoring will not be impacted for not having this. So don't feel like you have to put something in there just to put something in there. I think yeah. we also had another question from an individual mm-hmm. asking about uh, questions 17 and 130 of the survey, which address uh, uh, Ethisphere's question around ethnicity of board members as well as of C suite members. And for this year, we provided a little bit of extra guidance, but one part of the question asks companies to uh, look at those employees or board members and say, you know, do any of them identify as a different ethnicity based on the headquarter country of the company? And this can be a little confusing at times, especially if the country has operations at different places or multiple headquarters or situations where there may be on a stock market that isn't necessarily in the headquarter country. Uh, The guidance here is we would like to know, based on where your people are generally situated, uh, do these people self-report as being a different ethnicity from that, that main area or that hub of where the people tend to be? or gather or sit as a headquarters, rather than if, say, you are on the New York Stock Exchange, but your company is located in Japan, uh, and most of your people are in Japan. I would answer that based on your headquartering being in Japan. You know, completely agree. Completely agree. And, and to be candid for the audience today, this, uh, those types of questions are ones we've struggled to define clearly for many years now, right? We have a global process, a global survey, a global applicant pool, right? And defining how we capture diversity like metrics has always been uh, a unique challenge in in a global approach, right? So we make refinements every year. Uh, So we appreciate the comments and questions just like that to help us, again, provide some further refinement as we look to the future as well. Absolutely. 
Um, so Neil, I have a, uh, another question for you as well. This is one that we received, I think a few times in, in the interview, in, excuse me, intervening <laughs> weeks since our last office hours. And that is for someone new to this process, who's trying to get an estimate or a sense of how much time this takes to complete. I mean, what sort of guidance can we give those, those folks who are new to this, in this process? And I'll start with the very unsatisfactory answers and that, and that it depends, it depends <laughs> on a few different factors, many different factors. <laughs> Um, so I'll tease that up and you know, toss it to you if, if you have any uh, comments yourself that perhaps can illustrate what companies can expect to, uh, to go through. Uh, you know, know honestly, I would embrace that answer of it depends mm-hmm. and for a good reason. I, I don't want to introduce any uncertainty there. Um, I do want to say that there are so many different types of organizations that apply here. Uh, you know, there are very small companies that operate within one state and they have one place of business and they, you know, everybody is down the hall from each other. So you can get the answers fairly quickly and fairly easily. Uh, You know exactly who to go to for the third party section to talk about how your procurement department works. And it's pretty easy to get those answers back. Uh, However, for a much larger hundred thousand person multinational, uh, you may have to contact three different people and getting answers back may be a bit of a pain. Um, The best guidance I can give, having filled this out before for a large company, is develop a small plan to understand where the major functions of your company may live and who the contact point person would be for getting an answer. Try to plan that out first. Uh, For the impact section, if you have a dedicated ESG team, identify one or two people who may be able to answer some of these questions that you don't have the direct knowledge of. And that's fine if you don't have the the direct knowledge. We ask about a lot of different processes throughout an organization. Uh, Governance is another one where talking with the corporate secretary, we're talking with you know one of the C-suite leaders may help fill in some of the the questions you may might have around this area. Uh, Pass out different chunks of the survey, pass out and, and sort of flag for them, hey, this is what we're having a question about. Uh, can you help me answer this? And it's for the WMEC. Explain to them why you're getting this uh, this questionnaire to them. Uh, what specific questions they need to answer? Uh, I would just be, you know, very specific because we're all busy. We all have a lot of things on our plate. Uh, the best thing you can do is just sort of flag, hey, I need help with questions one, three, and five, and I'm just looking for an answer for this. If you're not the right person. Who can I talk to? Mm -hmm. Who knows this? It is a wonderful way to get to know more richly your own organization and where to find these answers if something else happens within the organization. Or if you're doing an evaluation of your own program and its connections throughout the organization. So again, I kind of circle back to it depends, but you're going to be in much better shape if you can start to put a plan together of who you need to talk to and doing that early within the process. Yeah, Daniel, that's 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 great. I completely agree. We had one question come in about when everything is due. Great question. I, I put on the screen here the uh, a collection of important dates throughout the process. So all materials are due on or before Friday, November 12th. Um, that's at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on that Friday. And we ask that, again, everything be submitted before that date, but they, it can come in at any point before that date and in any order, right? There's no, you're not beholden to any specific order on when the survey should be in versus the documentation. You can upload the documents piecemeal as they arrive. Um, all we ask is that we, everything's be, be received by our systems on or before that 12th of November deadline. Um, and again, here's a, a collection of other important dates along the, the journey throughout the application process as well. Um, so thank you for that question. One other question you know, that came in was about a term uh, for the impact section specifically. So we ask within impacts, uh, which is section nine of our ethics quotient survey and, and process, that what do you report out on from a, uh, an impacts perspective? And one of the, the categories we ask about is living wage criteria. And so we had a question from the group asking, well, what do we mean by, by living wage? And I'm curious, Neil, if you have any clarity you can provide to the group on what we mean by that term for that section. Certainly, certainly. Uh, living wage is a term that's come up more often in recent years uh, with, uh, with a lot of media attention to causes such as uh, the fight for 15 or uh, just general local news around uh, the ability of workers to be able to afford certain basic goods such as housing or food within their own local communities. Uh, living wage is a concept where companies and, and other individuals, and, as well as politicians, have discussed 
where does the basic wage need to meet the needs of employees within a community? And so living wage starts to get at how are people compensated in a way that is fair and that allows them to live and work and do so sustainably so that the organization can work, uh, the employee gets their needs met, and that the community thrives. Uh, So it's essentially what should that wage be is kind of that conversation. And that varies from location to location. Uh, it's, it's, you know, nobody has a great answer for it, but it is something that a lot of companies are paying quite a bit of attention to these days. And so we want to make sure that we understand where company, how companies are paying attention to it and what they're doing to address concerns around it. Mm-hmm. I also noticed, Doug, that, you know, we've had people question around measuring ethical culture this year. I know we've done some revisions to the ethical culture section this year. Not a lot, uh, but some. Um, I wonder if you could step us through that a little bit uh, before maybe we get to a couple of other questions. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, um, for the 2022 year, of course, measuring ethical culture and how companies approach that is is continuing to be a focus of ours as part of the evaluation process. Um, In terms of what we've looked at or what we've modified for this year in particular is We've tried to go a little bit broader than just a traditional survey process, right? Beyond surveys, how else are you essentially triangulating across multiple modalities to get a sense of what your employees are feeling, what are their perceptions of not only the program and its components, um, but also overall ethical culture? Are they comfortable speaking up? What's their overall perceptions of the the organization's justice? Are they comfortable going to their manager and making uh, reports or asking questions? Uh, we want to get a little bit beyond surveys. So that was a, a, a change in focal point for this year in particular. Um, I can say, Neil, to the point of the section broadly and, and having this section around as long as we have, it's been several years since we uh, introduced a, a dedicated section on measuring ethical culture. Um, one area where I commonly see companies, um, not st- stumble is the wrong word, but perhaps leave credit on the table is clearly articulate how your organization takes its efforts and outputs from measuring ethical culture internally. And how, how do you all translate that into actions and improvements for your program? And again, company broadly, right? So we've tried to be much more explicit this year in particular in the survey and in the documentation request to get a sense that you've done all this great work in, in capturing employee perceptions across the organization. What are you doing with that information? So try to be as clear as possible in, in articulating what that action looked like, what were the results, what were the outputs from that? And, you know, what were the lessons learned coming, coming out of that, that measurement effort, right? So that's really been a, a big focus for this year in particular in, in, in measuring ethical culture. And again, we hope that comes across in both the survey edits we've made, as well as the improvements or rather updates to the documentation guidelines as well. So again, for the community, if you all have any questions on how to approach that, we're available via the email address uh, Chelsea mentioned at the beginning, wmeapplications at ethosphere.com. Reach out. We're happy to talk through or discuss any questions or concerns you have on that section. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Neil, I noticed we actually received a question from the from the panel today or the group today regarding uh, documentation specific to culture. Um, and it really relates to timing, right? So we mentioned last webcast or rather last office hours about what's the the window, the appropriate time window for, for materials as it relates to submitting them for the, for the document or for the application, right? So what's the relevant time period we're looking at when asking for documents? And November 2020 to present day was the window we provided. And the question we received touch, touches on if there are any certain controls or activities that, let's say, take place on an every other year cadence, and for which this application period would fall on an off year cadence, how does that impact the process from their perspective, right? How, how does that come into play? And simply providing that to us as part of not only the, the written commentary provided for that section, one, helps illustrate that point for us, uh, but two, please do include the materials that perhaps would be um, conducted on the prior year when uh, the activity was active. For example, so if you're not doing an employee perception survey or engagement survey this year, but you did one last year as part of an every other year cadence, do provide the materials from the previous year and simply describe to us, look, this is an off year for us. This is only something we pursue every 24 months, Um, but here's what we saw in the previous effort. And by the way, we're committed to doing it again for the next year as well. So providing that to us in both the documentation component and the written explanation component gives our team a full understanding of your program, the frequency with which these efforts are undertaken, and we should be able to give the appropriate amount of credit for that description as well. 
Neil, Absolutely. from your perspective and what you've seen, anything you want to clarify on that approach oh, or? A hundred percent agree. We do want to see the color around your efforts, you know, and, and whether that happens on a, a multi-year schedule, that kind of a thing. It is those efforts and that attention that we do want to see to different elements of the program and measurement and, and collecting and understanding. Uh, you know, we're, we're not sitting here uh, projecting a cadence onto a uniform singular cadence onto every company. Every, every company is individual and different and needs to do things in its own way. And so we, we want to see how you all put that into practice. So absolutely, let us know. Give us those explanations and that documentation that really, really helps us out. I mean, with, within reason, don't, don't throw us the kitchen sink so that we're, we're drowning and stuff. But yeah, show us those examples that shine. Uh, uh, but give, us, give us that elevator speech in a way. Completely agree, Neil. Completely agree. So uh, a reminder to the group today, we have just a few minutes remaining on our time. Today, we end at half past the hour for today's office hours. Uh, one other question for you, Neil, I have is, uh, and this is one that was submitted by uh, participants prior to today's conversation, but um, how do we log in and submit our application? Right? Um, for some folks who are waiting on their login information or have not yet received it, received it, what's the process they can expect to go through? How can they receive support? Any guidance you, know, you can perhaps provide to the panel today or the group today on that topic? Yes. Yes. Um, so this year we have switched to a formal portal at eq.ethosphere.com. Uh, we will send to your primary contact, uh, the one that contacted us about applying through that through that website. Uh, be patient as we do have a process where we need to get you into our system, uh, get login credentials generated and set up in our system. What we do is we take that information that you gave us about you, your uh, your email, the company name, set that up, and then we email back to you a username and a password that you will, you, you, you will use by going to uh, eq.ethosphere.com. It will show you what's up right now there in the slide uh, where you'll see these three boxes down at the bottom. The one on the left you can click that start the survey button down there to start inputting your answers to the survey. Uh, while Doug and I would strongly suggest that you uh, you download a copy of the survey first to take a look at it before you start to upload stuff, uh, you're certainly welcome to fill that out right away. Uh, the processing fee, one of the other parts, you can click there to either request an invoice. Uh, you can do that through this link rather than emailing us if you need to. But you can also pay that right away by way of credit card through that site. And the third is this documentation area over here. Uh, we are working on setting up all of the links to your box site. Uh, it's a secure method through which you can transfer documents into a secure area for our reviewers. Uh, if you're having difficulty reaching that site, do let us know at WME Applications. Uh, we will look on the back end, make sure everything's set up. If you have a corporate policy which prevents you from interacting with Box, let us know and we can find a solution to help work with you to get these documents. Uh, but everything is in this portal this year. Uh, again, as Doug mentioned earlier, you know, we're having some people having a little bit of difficulty with getting the username and password put in right. Uh, you know, again, there's some spaces around the end of it uh, in copy and paste. Try a couple of, uh, you know, type. avoid using Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer has some difficulties with this site. So try Chrome, Firefox, things like that. Great. And Doug, I, I think we have a question that came in around uh, processing fees and, and payment and things like that. Yeah, you're, uh, uh, the question we received was, can you pay by a wire this year? I think that worked last year and years previous. And yes, you can. Um, you have the ability to request an invoice if you don't want to go through an automatic payment portal or payment process. You're welcome to email us and request an invoice. We'll be happy to provide one to you. And that time. processing fee link, there is actually a way once you put in your information, you can tell it send me an invoice rather than putting in a uh, uh, putting in a credit card. That just awesome. makes it makes it a little easier for us. So great. All right. Well, and with that, I think we're out of time for today's session. Neil, thank you so much for the time.